Psalm 91, verses 14 to 16. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. With the word of God open before us, let's bow our hearts again, asking for the help of God's Spirit in our study tonight. Our Father in heaven, we have before us a book like none other. We confess that this is thy word, a word that is forever settled in heaven, a book that is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, this book is a life-giving book. It's a hammer to break the hardest of hearts. It's a fire to burn in our bones. Lord, we would ask that we might feel the full weight of thy word tonight. Make it a living word. Speak to our hearts through it. May we have hearts tonight to respond to thee and to bring glory and praise and honor to thy great name. Come and help us by thy spirit, we cry. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture is very clear that God created the world. He made the heavens and the earth without the aid of man. He didn't go to any man for wisdom or strength because man was a product of the Lord's creating. The Lord spoke and it was done. The Creator, after making all things, continues to govern the world that He has made, continues to rule over it in His providence. And as we begin to think in Scripture of our God, we have to confess that this One who made the world and this One who rules the world is in and of Himself completely self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything from the creature or from the creation in order to exist. In fact, one day the Lord will destroy this creation and start all over again. In contrast to the Lord, the creature is completely dependent upon the Creator and upon His creation. A person's life is given by God, and that person is completely accountable to the Lord for how He uses His mind, His heart, His hands, His feet, His whole being. When you consider God in comparison with man, there's really no comparison. Man is truly insignificant when he is standing alongside the Lord who made him. While the Lord does not need his creatures, he is completely self-sufficient, yet he condescends to have a relationship with them. This relationship starts in heaven. It does not start in the heart of fallen man. From heaven, God instructs the Spirit to come and to change the heart of fallen man so that man will desire God and want to fellowship and commune with Him. And then having given man those desires, God then responds to those desires as He sees them acted out in the life of the believer. You know, as parents, we, in a very real sense, are responsible for the physical existence of our children. Alongside of God, they are made and created through their parents. We bring them into the world, we feed them, we clothe them, and we instruct or train them. And yet at the same time, we desire to have a relationship with our children. A parent who callously disregards The needs of his children is viewed even by the world as being evil or wicked. A good parent responds to the love of his children and seeks to nurture that love and to nurture that relationship. In an even greater way, we can consider our God who created this world and made us. This God desires from us a relationship. He wants us to know Him. He wants us to love Him. He wants us to trust Him. That's an amazing statement. He brings us to Himself in salvation. He gives us in that salvation a desire to know Him and to please Him. And then when we know Him and please Him, He responds to that with even greater blessing. 
What a great God we adore. Tonight I want us to consider some of the statements here at the end of this psalm that deal with our Lord's desire for us to love Him. Most of this psalm is dealing with the psalmist's look at himself or at other believers. He is describing the relationship that believers have with the Lord. They have come to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And because of that, they abide under the shadow of the Almighty. They have come to trust in the Lord. He is their refuge, their buckler. He is the one that they run to when they're in trouble. That's looking at the relationship from man's standpoint. But when we come to the end of the psalm, we have the relationship expressed from God's standpoint. In our American way of writing hymns, we oftentimes have the body of the hymn, and then we have a refrain that's sung afterwards. We had that in one of the hymns tonight. I know whom I have believed. And we sang a refrain after each stanza. Well, here it's as if God has given us the hymn, looking at the relationship from man's standpoint, and then the Lord himself comes and he sings to us the refrain. Did you notice the change in person? When you come to verse 14, the Lord is speaking. Because he, that is the one who's described earlier in the psalm, the one who's under the shadow of the Almighty, the one who is trusting in the Lord, because he has set his love upon me. That's the Lord speaking. Because he has done that, the Lord says, I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. This is the Lord's way of viewing what is done on earth. Tonight, if you have come and said to the Lord, as is earlier expressed in the psalm, Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress. You are my God, and I will trust in you. If you have expressed that, here is the response from heaven to your heart. Here is what the Lord says to you tonight. This is what He views the action in your heart. Oh, I admit tonight that the, the action in your heart is but a response already to the Lord's dealings. His election, His regeneration has changed the heart. But having said that, He does now respond as well to what is found in your heart. As you express it in faith. As you express it in love. As you express it in prayer. The Lord is indeed recognizing what is going on in the heart and soul, and He is responding. Tonight the theme of our message is that we are to be encouraged to obey the Lord fully by seeing His own gracious response to our trusting. Let's look first of all at what is said in this psalm concerning the conduct of the believer and how the Lord recognizes that conduct of the true believer. Earlier, the believer, as I said, stand, is described from man's standpoint. is described as one who's trusting in the Lord, one who has come to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. But now he's described from God's standpoint. And there's a threefold description here of this believer. You'll note in verse 14, the Lord sees the believer's love. This is what he says in verse 14, because he has set his love upon me. The Lord tonight sees your love. Oftentimes, the love that we have is something that's hidden. It's only in the heart. It will be expressed by actions, but the heart itself is where love begins. It's more than an emotion in Scripture. It says here we have set our love upon the Lord. That has to do with the will. It has to do with our mind. And yet it never says earlier in the psalm that we have set our love upon Him. How did we set our love upon Him? We did so when we came to trust in Him. We did so when we committed our soul to Him, our way to Him, our salvation to Him. When you did that, you were setting your love upon the Lord. This is not the normal word for love in the Old Testament. This word uh, has a stress in it on what you attach yourself to. As one man has said, it emphasizes that which attaches to something or someone. In the case of emotions, it is that love which is already bound to its object. It's a deep inward attachment. When God is said to love with this word, it has to do with his own volition being expressed, not because of anything good or desirable in the object. He has just said, I'm going to attach myself to that person or that group of people 
And in doing so, he loves them. We can be commanded to love those who are unlovely, those from whom we receive nothing back in return. A man or a woman can choose to love the unlovely. He can actually be commanded to love the unlovely. God commands it out of us. He commands you and I to love those who do not love in return. He commands us to love sinners who are in rebellion. He does so because he himself loves us in that regard. And he has demonstrated love time and time again toward us in bringing us to himself. But in this passage of Scripture, it's not so much us loving the unlovely. We are loving the God who is lovely. And if there's any reason for us not to love an individual on earth, we don't have that reason when we come to the Creator, the one who made us. We ought to love Him with our whole being because He's lovely. We owe everything to Him. And yet, it is the mark of the unbeliever that he does not love God. That he rebels against God. That he replaces God with an imitation. One of the first marks of a believer's heart after he comes to trust in the Lord is that he now loves the Lord. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, he speaks there, that is the Apostles Paul speaks there, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. John speaks of that love. He says in chapter 5, verse 1 of his epistle, Everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. We love the one who did the begetting. We are begotten of God. We're born of God. We are regenerated. We love him. His Spirit has caused that love to exist in our hearts for God. And we love those creatures who are also begotten by God. Love and trust go hand in hand. We know that in the marriage relationship. And truly in this relationship that we have with the Lord, our trust and our love go side by side. They're intertwined. You cannot just speak of one without speaking of the other. The Lord recognizes that tonight. You're laboring to trust Him. You're laboring to know your sins forgiven. You are laboring to lay hold of Him. And He is in heaven saying, there's a person who loves me. There's a person who has attached themselves to me. He sees that love tonight. Imperfect though it may be. Weak at times though it may be. Yet tonight, He takes note of the fact that you love Him. Him. That's what it says. Because he has set his love upon me, I'm going to do this. Would you note the second thing that he says that he notes about this believer, the one who's come to trust in him, is that he notes that this person knows his name. He says at the end of verse 14, I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Now, knowing the name is more than knowing about the name. The world knows about the name of Jehovah. The world knows about the name of Jesus Christ. But he, the world does not know his name. Knowledge often has the idea of experience in Scripture. Has the idea of interaction. Or it has the idea of this loving between two individuals. And to know the name of the Lord is more than just knowing about the name. It's honoring the name. It's acknowledging the name. In fact, sometimes this very word is translated to acknowledge. When you come to Proverbs chapter 3, it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, acknowledge the Lord. And this word to acknowledge is the same word here, to know. You and I are to acknowledge his name. We are to show reverence. We are to show honor to that name. We are to prefer that name. We are to call that name over us. The Lord takes note of those who honor his name. Now, the name of the Lord oftentimes was a means of revelation. God was telling people something about himself in his name. We can't go through all the names of Scripture, but someone has said that there is a name in Scripture that corresponds to every fear of man. So whatever you're afraid of, God reveals in his very names that which you need to know to overcome that fear. There are many names in Scripture. And God takes it very seriously when men pervert His name, when they blaspheme His name, because that is a revelation of Himself. Can we not say that His Word also is a revelation of Himself? 
When we see that the Word, that is the name, is a revelation of God, and God takes seriously the blasphemy of His name, then we can also see that this one who's exalted His Word above His name, that He takes very seriously anyone who distorts or perverts this book that He has written. The Lord receives the believer's love. The Lord also sees and receives the believer's honor. He knows those who are associating themselves with his name, and they are honoring that name in their life. And they're honoring that name as they're in the world. But thirdly, we find that the Lord hears the believer's prayer. The Lord is eager to listen to the prayers of those who are trusting in him. If you are trusting in him, as is expressed earlier in the psalm, it will flow from your heart that you're going to talk to him, that you're going to speak to him. And so we find in verse 15, it says, He shall call upon me. I doubt very seriously the salvation of any individual who is not calling upon the Lord. It is something put within the heart. It is, as it were, a response to the great God who is dealing with the heart that we want to pray back to Him. Now, we may not know how to order our words. We may not pray as eloquently as we think we ought to. But if you have been saved, there is a desire from within to speak to the one who saved you. You want to talk to him. You want to commune with him. And he takes note of that. The one who trusts in the Lord prays to the Lord. He brings his burdens to the Lord. And the Lord has his eyes open to their cry. He has his ears open to their words. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. If tonight you're one of those who have come into the secret place, you've come to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, If tonight you can say, Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress. I have come to trust in you. The Lord sees that love in your heart. The Lord sees that honoring of his name. And the Lord sees and hears the cry that comes from your heart when you come and speak to him. This is the Lord speaking. He will call upon me. That is the one who has trusted in the Lord. I find it interesting that when the prophet had to come and rebuke the king, King Asa, he says one of the most staggering statements about the Lord anywhere found in Scripture. In Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, the prophet said this to Asa, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The eyes of the Lord are running in the earth. There's a mixing of figures of speech. Your eyes don't run. The Lord doesn't have physical eyes like we have. It's saying that He sees. And He's looking at everything going on in the earth. And He's running through the earth. And what is He looking for? He's looking for the heart that is perfect toward Him. Now, this is a rebuke to Asa, who had just gone to the enemies of the Lord for help and strength. And the Lord is rebuking him. Shouldn't have done that. And here you have this expression, the Lord is looking to help those who want help from Him, those who are calling upon Him, those whose hearts are perfect toward Him. That is, they're trusting in Him. The Lord from heaven is looking tonight. We can say, I believe, based on that passage of Scripture, the Lord is more anxious for you to pray than you are to pray. He's actually looking for the praying heart. And if you're trusting in Him, you will pray. Just as if you're trusting in Him, you will love Him. Just as if you're trusting in Him, you are going to try to honor His name. This is the Lord looking in the earth, and this is how He sees us tonight. It may not be the way that we see ourselves. We're laboring to believe. We're laboring to come overcome belief. We're laboring to be found in the secret place where our sins are washed away by the high priest's ministry in that secret place. That's what we're looking for. And yet he is seeing a heart of love. He is seeing someone honoring his name. He is seeing somebody calling upon him. The Lord takes very seriously anybody who comes and throws the weight of the dependence of their soul upon him. He takes that seriously. 
I know parents that may not take that seriously. Their own child depends upon them, and parents seems to be uh, just oblivious to the fact that the child has needs and could care less that the child is going hungry or going unclothed. But here is a God who, when someone comes and throws the weight of their dependence upon him, he responds. He notices. He notices. While you and I might throw our weight of dependence upon an earthly mortal and find that they turn a deaf ear and they don't help and they don't respond, that's not true of Jehovah. That's not true of the Most High. That's not true of the Almighty. If you have come to trust in Him, He responds, He hears, He sees, He notices. The Lord recognizes the conduct of a true believer. And I want us then to think on the response of the Lord to that conduct. The Lord responds to the conduct of the true believer. You'll see that there are a number of things that are stated here. We could list them all tonight. I'd rather try to group them together as to how they uh, have similarities. The first thing I'd want you to note tonight is that the Lord delivers from danger. Three times it speaks of deliverance or salvation. In each one of these verses, in fact, it speaks of it. It says it in verse 14, verse 15, and then again in verse 16. Each time there is a different Hebrew word. The first two times the word deliver is indeed synonyms. They are very much parallel. I could find no difference really as to how they're used. In the first occurrence here in verse 14, it says, Because he has set his love upon thee, therefore I will deliver him. This word for deliverance or rescue occurs 19 times of its 21 occurrences in the book of Psalms. Something stated about the Lord and the way he delivers his people over and over again, and it's stated in the book of worship. God wants you in your worship to focus on the fact he is the one who brings the deliverance. The second word for deliverance that occurs in verse 15, as I have said, is a, uh, a parallel word and a synonym to the first word. It also means to rescue or deliver or to pull out of distress. And we find here in verse 15 that this one who trusts the Lord will call upon him. And the Lord says, I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. There are times that we get in trouble. This word for trouble has the idea of narrowing something, of squeezing something. How often it is your trials have that effect upon the heart. There are times that the squeezing gets so great you feel like crying out. And the Lord says, when you come and call upon me, I will answer, and I'm going to come in the midst of that narrowing, as it were, in the midst of that squeezing, and I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to deliver you. The Lord delivers from danger. It says in verse 14, he will deliver us because we have loved him. It says in verse 15, he will deliver us when we call upon him. And then at the end of verse 16, it says, I will show him my salvation. This is the normal word for salvation. It's coupled with the word Jehovah to make up the name Joshua. Jehovah saves. This is the verb form of that root. And it's used to, again, express deliverance, to express rescue. Only this time it's used in the Scriptures often for that description of the salvation from sin. The Lord said, I will show you my salvation. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to give you this salvation in all of its fullness, in all of its glory. Now, we associate that with trusting in Him. We trust and He's saved. We believe upon Him. He washes away our sins and gives to eternal life. And that trust truly is part of all of these things that the Lord sees in our hearts. That trust causes us to, to, to love. That trust causes us to honor his name. That trust causes us to call upon him. And he says, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to deliver you out of trouble. I will make you know my salvation. You're going to know it. And so the Lord responds to this love, to this honoring of the name of the Lord, to this calling with deliverance. But the Lord also exalts the sinner. You see, this twice expressed is found in verse 14, and then again in verse 15. In verse 14 it says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. I'm going to set him on high. This word for setting on high means to be inaccessibly high. 
one that's so high that you can't come near to that person. It's associated with a notion of height and frequently has the connotation of security. The commentator said another connotation is that of exaltation to a position of honor. I'm going to set him on high where he can't be attacked. That certainly goes with the flow of what has been said of him protecting us. He's going to protect us. How? He's going to set us on high. You know, the eagle will set its nest in the mountaintop so that man can't reach it and predators can't reach the nest. The Lord says, I'm going to take and I'm going to set this one on high. But you know, in the immediate context, especially at the end of verse 15, you have this idea of honor. I'm going to take this one that's lowly in the eyes of the world. This one is trusting in me and the world's scoffing at him, mocking him. This one who's honoring my name and the world is trying to get him to dishonor my name. I'm going to trust that. I'm going to take that person and I'm going to set them on high, far above all that are against them. They're going to be honored in the earth. And that is what the Lord does for his people. It's possible no one else knows your name on this earth. And that those that know that name of yours uh, look at you with, with uh, disdain because you're one of those believers. You're, you're one of those Christians. You're to be pitied. You don't have the intellect to make it in the earth. You don't have the strength and the wisdom to make it in the earth. So you're leaning upon the Lord. That's how they view a believer. And the believer says to you, the Lord says to you, I'm going to set you on high. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. At the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, our Lord speaks concerning those who are truly blessed. We don't have time to work our way through this. Brother Chris did this in Sabbath school a few years ago. I want you just to look at the end of these Statements about being blessed, the last few of them. It says in, in verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The Lord says, I'm setting you on high. Yes, they're mocking you. Yes, they're persecuting you. But that's just what they did to all my prophets in the past. I greatly rewarded them. I'm going to greatly reward you. You might say, well, I've never been like Elijah. Never been like Moses. Never had the boldness of a Micaiah. And yet the Lord is giving me the same reward. Because I have identified with his name. Because I am trusting in him. And I'm receiving the ridicule of the world. He's going to set me on high in this glorious position of honor. You may not see it yet on this earth. But there's coming a day, as we were remarking this morning, when he is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the goats will be dishonored in that day. The goats will be destroyed in that day. And those that are his sheep, who were like sheep for the slaughter, to use the language of the Apostle Paul, while they are in the earth, in that day, they will be exalted and welcomed into his kingdom. They will be seen to be the children of God. They'll inherit the earth. The Lord says, because he hath known my name, I'm going to set him on high. You know, the Lord honors his own name. He has right to do so because that's proper and good. And he honors that name and he protects that name. He will not give his glory to another. And when you side with that name and you go about in the earth to honor that name and uplift that name and glory in that name, he notes that. And he says, I will set you on high. We find as well him stating this honoring and exalting of the man of God, the woman of God, at the end of verse 15. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. This word for honor is is in its root uh, the idea of weighty. 
Something that weighs a lot. It's to be heavy, weighty. It's rarely used that way in Scripture. Most of the time it's used in a figurative sense for honoring. What is honoring? It's when you take and you view someone as weighty in the community or weighty in society. We still use the word weight in that way. God says, I'm going to make you to be viewed as a weighty person in the earth. I'm going to honor you. You will be, indeed, worthy of respect one day. Now, we know that our Lord will be worthy of respect. The Lord has said concerning our Lord, God has said concerning our Lord, that every knee is going to bow to Him, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They're going to confess He is Lord in a manner that pleases God the Father. They're not just going to say it from their lips while their heart is rebelling. No, they will say it in a manner that pleases God. But you're His body. And if the head is exalted and honored, you too will be exalted and honored. You are his bride. And if the bridegroom is honored, he is going to present the bride to himself publicly according to Ephesians 5. You then will be honored. You will be considered a weighty person, not because of who you are, not because of your abilities, not because of your wisdom, not because you accumulated earth. The wealth in the earth, you will be considered a weighty person because you're connected to Jesus Christ. He truly is a weighty person. You and I receive his honor. We receive his honor. The Lord delivers us. The Lord exalts us. And then we find here the Lord answers our prayers by giving to our needs. This is an amazing thing. This one who created the earth stoops and bows to hear us call upon him. It says in verse 15, he shall call upon me and I will answer. Here you have uh, God listening to our cries. Our cries. Your cry, my cry. You can't get the politicians to listen to you. You pick up the phone and you get their secretary. Secretary says that they'll... Relay of the message, most of the time the relay goes right into the basket. But he hears your cry. You call upon him and the one who created you, the one who created the earth, the one who even con- created and controls your enemies, hears your cry. He is listening to your cry. That's what this psalmist says. The Lord who notices your love, the Lord who notices the fact that you know his name, the Lord who hears your prayer, responds to that. He says, I will answer him. Well, how does he answer? Well, you find the first statement after this is, I will be with him in trouble. I'll be with him. I'll be with him. What an amazing statement. This one who created the ends of the earth hears us, and he says, I'm going to be with you in your trouble. I find that hard to believe, humanly speaking. And yet the Scripture tells me over and over and over again that this is our God, that he will hear, he will answer, and he'll be with us in trouble. You've heard it said, perhaps, that children should be seen and not heard. Children should be seen and not heard. Usually that statement is made because of the arrogance a child is displaying in the presence of adults. But this is not the attitude of our Lord, that his children should be seen and not heard. It's just the opposite. He wants his children to speak. He wants his children to call upon him. And he says, if you call upon me, I'm going to be right there with you. You can call on a parent. Many times they can't come to your aid. We have cell phones, and you can call a parent wherever they are in the earth almost. But that doesn't mean they can run to your aid. They may not be able to come to you. It may take a plane ride. It may take days of travel to get to you. But not so with the Lord. The Lord said, this one who trusts in me, when they call, I will answer and I will be with them in the trouble. I'll be right there. Be right there. 
He has promised here the deliverance. We see that as the next statement as to there is response to those who call upon him. He says, I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. And then he says, I will honor him. And then he says, with long life will I satisfy him. The Hebrew literally says, length of days I will satisfy him with. This word to satisfy is oftentimes used in Scripture of someone being satisfied by nourishment. You eat until you're full, until you have no desire for any more food. Now, that's not gluttony. That's satisfaction. Gluttony is when you stick your finger down your throat and then eat again and then eat again and eat again. God likes that His people are satisfied by His blessings. And here you have the statement being made by the Lord that He will give us satisfaction. But where is that satisfaction? With length of days. A good friend of mine that was an evangelist and later a pastor in the Chicago area, in his 40s he died. He died. And you can look at that and you can say, here is a man who was doing great things. And he was. He, he took over a pastor. church had about 200 people. When the first year or so came about, uh, it, it, it increased, doubled. And then it was around 700 people. And then they started another church. And they started another church. And I believe they started a third church in the Chicago area. And then the Lord took him. Was he satisfied with length of days? Well, if you only look in this life at the time someone spends, you might say, well, he wasn't really satisfied with length of days. But when you think of the fact that God gives to his people eternal life, we're all satisfied with that. That's more than we can sink our teeth into. Eternal life doesn't end with this life. If you die at the age of 30, you have eternal life. And if you die on this earth at the age of 40, you have eternal life. God satisfies His people, truly, with length of days. You know, He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And you're going to walk on a new earth similar to this one, but there'll be no sin, there'll be no pain, there'll be no death. And the Lord will be the glory of that earth. When it speaks of eternal life, it's speaking of that kind of life. So, yes, you're going to have to say goodbye to this life, no matter how long you live. If you live to be 90, you live to be 100 or 110, you're still going to say goodbye to this life. But he does satisfy his people with length of days because he gives them eternal life. Eternal life. The friend I was speaking of, when he left this earth, stepped right into the presence of the great king. And he began to live as he has never lived on this earth. And I've never known a man who was so powerful and an individual witness as this man. And yet now he's in the presence of God and experiencing power, experiencing blessing, like he never experienced on this earth. The Apostle Paul himself said for him to depart and be with Christ was far better. Not just better, but far better. The option from the body was to be present with the Lord. God says, I will satisfy you. Not with temporal life. Not with a few days. But with a lengthening of the days. I will satisfy you with eternal life. As we have given to us in the New Testament. With him I will be in distress. Length of days I will satisfy him. What kind of a God is this? This is a God who loves his people. Who responds to our love with a greater love than we can imagine. We also find in this passage, that is in this psalm, a statement about the Lord rewarding the conduct of the unbeliever. Well, the Lord recognizes the conduct of the believer. That's clearly stated in these last three verses. And the Lord responds to that conduct. He responds to that faith, to that love, to that honoring of him. But the Lord also responds to the conduct of the unbeliever. He will reward that conduct. You say, where does it say that? Look at verse 8. In speaking of the believer, it says, Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. The Lord's going to give to the wicked what they have earned. This word for reward is a word that has to do with recompense. 
It has to do with the paying of something. Uh, actually, it's the same word or same root from which we get the word shalom. Shalom means peace. It means making something whole. And this word has them to do with paying someone. They've earned something. They've worked for you. You're going to make whole the relationship by paying them what they've earned. In this case, it has to do with the reward of the wicked. They have earned this. And God says, right, this is what you have earned. You're going to be paid in full. New Testament uses that kind of language when it says the wages of sin is death. You see, if we're not under the shadow of the Almighty, if we're not trusting in Him, then we don't have a relationship with Him. And instead of loving, we hate. Instead of honoring His name, we dishonor it. Instead of calling upon Him in truth, if we do call upon Him, it's in hypocrisy. And our Lord will reward that. This is not about religion now. This is not about how you fare in a church or whether you can get thousands of people to come to your church. This is about your relationship with the Lord. And the Lord will respond to that conduct that is indeed a hatred of Him. You say, what do you mean a hatred of Him? Well, it says here that He notes that you love Him. When you come and you set your trust in Him, when you come to know Him, He says, you love me. And yet there are many in the earth that truly hate him. Turn, if you would, to the Ten Commandments that are found in uh, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Because the Lord here speaks about those who hate him. Again, this is the Lord speaking. This is how the Lord views the earth. It may not be the way you view it. In fact, I dare say that many of those that are spoken of here in verses 3 to 6 are viewed by mankind as loving the Lord, and yet the Lord says they hate me. They hate me. In verse 3, the Lord says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you have any other god before him, you're in sin. As you read down further, it says, Thou shalt not make any unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments." God says you hate me when you make an image and you bow down to that image. When you replace me with another God, you hate me. That's how the Lord views that. But we're going to call this idol by the name of the Lord. That's the way they did it in the Old Testament. That's the way the Church of Rome does it in the New Testament. We call the idol by the name of the Lord. Certainly, that ought to satisfy the Lord. The Lord says, when you make such an image, and then you bow to that image, you hate me. And I'm going to visit you. And when it speaks here about visiting the children under the third and fourth generation, he's talking about punishing. I will punish you for that sin of hating me. You know, when they rejected the prophet... It was the same as rejecting the Lord. That's what was told to Samuel. The nation rejected him. Samuel was in and of himself cast down. He was the judge. He was the prophet. And they rejected him, saying, we want a king. The Lord said, they have rejected you. They've rejected me. And when people come and they reject the Lord and they reject his word, they are really rejecting the Lord, not so much the book. And we have those who are trying to replace the Lord with a block of wood. They're trying to replace the Lord with a stone. They're trying to replace the Lord with a piece of metal. Or they're trying to replace the Lord with a wafer and a cup. And the Lord says, when you do that, you hate me. But they're saying that they love the Lord. The Lord says, no, you don't love me. I told you not to do that. You hate me. You have replaced me with that which is not real. You can take a look around here. There are no pictures here. Suppose pictures of Christ. That is by design. We don't know what Jesus Christ looks like. We don't. And I defy anyone here, 
anyone in our society, any man who says he has a prophetic gift, I defy anyone to show me a picture of Jesus Christ. We don't know what he looks like. The one thing I am sure of, though, is that when people have a picture before them and bow before that picture, the one they're bowing before is not the Christ of Scripture. It's not him. Some artist's conception of somebody... But it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're bowing before maybe somebody that the artist knew and he drew and said, this is Jesus Christ. Or maybe it's just the figment of his imagination. But in either case, it's not my Lord. And we're not to make an idol of Christ. We're not to bow down to that. You worship by faith. As they did in the Old Testament, you worship by faith. And you start making these idols and you will be guilty of hating him. Because you're worshiping something that doesn't exist. It's not Jesus Christ. The Lord notices that His people love Him, that they've come to trust in Him. But the Lord also notices those who hate Him, and He will give them the reward. He will give them what is due. He will give them according to their sin of hating Him. The wicked also dishonor His name. And the Lord recognizes and rewards that dishonor toward himself. Again, you come to this passage of Scripture, and what does it say concerning his name? In verse 7 it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The Lord notes when his people honor his name. The Lord also notes when his name is taken in vain. And he will not hold them guiltless. That is, he is going to hold them responsible. He is going to punish that person, that individual, for the blasphemy concerning his name, for the dishonoring of his name. And so when you use that name in cursing, when that name is something is used lightly, you know it's used lightly sometimes in the place of worship. People dancing around and just throwing the name of Lord here and there and yonder. They're not using his name in a place of reverence or in a reverential way. Stub your toe. The explicative is to use the Lord's name. The Lord says, I, I hear that. I hear that. And it may be something that they, they like to do on the earth. And you have to have the taking of the Lord's name in vain in every movie now because it won't get by the, the censors. It won't be applauded by those who are judging movies today. We're going to take his name in vain. But the Lord says, I hear that. And I won't hold you guiltless when you dishonor my name. And you and I are living in a time in this country where... You can hardly go anywhere without hearing somebody loudly blaspheme the name of Christ. That name that you and I love to sing about. That name that you and I glory in. We can't say a prayer without saying it's in Jesus' name. That name that is now exalted and that name that will be exalted for all eternity is something precious to us. And it's hard to hear people take our Lord's name in vain. And yet there are those perhaps here tonight. And you've been so much about the world that you've begun to adopt their language. And you're starting to use his name in a manner that is dishonoring. Do you know him? Do you know him? How can you laugh about that name? How can you ridicule that name? How can you use that name in foul language? Are you so afraid of man? That little bag of bones, are you so afraid of that man or that woman that you're going to use his name, defile that name, so that you'll fit in with those that ought to do it as well? It's not easy to know how to rebuke sometimes the wicked. They're so bold in the way they use his name in vain. I can remember when I was at Wade Hampton High School and there was a young man that was, had to work with us. And he began to, to use all kinds of profanity. All kinds of profanity. And I took him aside and I said to him, you know, I appreciate your labors. I appreciate the fact that you're laboring here and you're doing this and you're doing that. If you just did one thing, it would certainly help the environment a great deal. 
and it would make me much happier. And this fellow was, you know, what, what is it you want me to do? You're the boss. What is it you want me to do? I said, would you please stop taking my Lord's name in vain? If you use my mother's name the way you use my Lord's name, it would offend me. And I love my Lord more than I love my mother. And it offends me. Thankfully, the Lord gave him a heart of repentance, at least around me, and he stopped doing that. And I remember several times coming into the area where this young man was working, and evidently they were talking in a manner that was not pleasing, and he was like, shh, 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 here comes the preacher. You know, here comes the preacher. Well, fine. It's a name that I love. It's a name you love. Why? Because it represents, it's the name of your Savior. The Lord knows. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. But you know, taking his name in vain can be more than just blaspheming the name or using it in foul language or cursing. Taking his name in vain can also be associated with taking that name of the Lord and putting it on something that has nothing to do with the Lord or something that's contrary to the Lord. So we have a work salvation. It's called Christianity. We have a, 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 a Godhead that is not the Trinity. It's not the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that are God. And we say that's Christian. We have that being done all through society. In the name of ecumenism, let's get all together. And we all have faith. It doesn't matter what you believe, who you believe, or the doctrine of your salvation. We're just going to all get together and we put the name Christian on it. Well, you know, when Moses came down from the mount, they had made a calf, and they were worshiping that calf. They were calling it by the name of Jehovah, and they were saying, that calf delivered us out of Egypt. Was the Lord happy with that? And you start taking the name of Christ and associating it with that which is displeasing to the Lord, you are blaspheming his name, and he will notice that, and he will not hold you guiltless. We are not to take his name and associate it with that which is of the devil. We're not to take his name and associate it with that which denies the Godhead or denies the doctrine of salvation by grace. We're not to do that. And you say, I don't like it when men take my Lord's name in vain. It bothers me. Well, does it bother you as well when they take that name and they identify with that which is contrary to that name, with that which is going to damn souls? There doesn't seem to be any love for the name. Because we're going to use that name any way we wish, as long as it makes money, or as long as it makes a big crowd, or as long as it is something that is used to bring all kinds of people together, we'll use his name. It doesn't matter. It does matter. It's not your name, and it's not my name. It's his name. And it means something. And you and I are to not associate that name which is not about that name. And so when we have uh, in Romanism those who are using that name to identify a work salvation, or you have in Mormonism or the Jehovah's Witness cult those who are denying the Godhead and they're using that name, they are taking the Lord's name in vain. Taking it in vain. I realize that many of the people in these movements are ignorant. They're just completely ignorant. And they're being told that this is Christianity. And it's hard to open their eyes without the Lord's help. Uh, you, you feel the futility of your efforts. But you have to keep telling them, no, this is not Christian. No, this is not what Jesus Christ meant when he talks about salvation or he talks about the Godhead. That's not what's being spoken of in Scripture. Why do you do that? Because you're honoring his name. And you're trying to say, that's not of Christ. It's not of Christ. I understand that some are going to say, well, you're just a troublemaker. You love to stir up trouble. No, we're honoring his name. We're honoring his name. And how can you say it's not important? The Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We have said here, the Lord recognizes among His people their prayers. He hears and He responds to that. But does He respond to the prayers spoken in hypocrisy? When James chapter 4 
James is speaking about the troubles that are in the church, and he says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill, ye cannot obtain. Then he goes on to say, Ye desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not, ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Here is the Lord analyzing prayer. You don't have because you don't ask. Or you ask, but you ask without repentance. Is that why there's not so many prayer meetings today? Is that the reason why even at the prayer meetings things are being done other than praying? I know what's being done in other churches, brother. I know what's being done in other churches. And I could cancel the prayer meeting and change it into something else. I've been asked to do so. And I refuse to do so. To me, when we cancel the prayer meeting, I'm shutting the doors and going home. I want nothing to do with the church anymore. You believe on the Lord, you are going to pray. And you won't be making excuses as to not being at the prayer meeting. You're going to be making excuses in other realms to get to the prayer meeting because you want to pray. You want to speak. You want to be heard. You want to see Him come. You want to see Him move. You want to be there. You say, if we just make it another service, we'll have more people. If we make it a young people's night, we'll have more people. Well, you might. But when does the church ever get together and pray? Brethren, if we're not going to pray, you can kiss this country goodbye. It's on a downhill slope right now. And things are pulling it down the hill fast from many different directions. And if you and I won't come and seek the Lord's face and pray and call upon Him, there's no hope for this country. God's going to have to intervene. And part of that intervention is going to be His people calling upon Him. But if there's no repentance, there's going to be no answer. Just as if there's no atonement, there's not going to be an answer. You and I have to have an atonement for our sins, but we also must turn from our sins. And what the church is trying to do Let's call upon the Lord. Let's sneak up. He doesn't know what we're doing. And we can just live our life in sin. We can do everything the world is doing. And He's going to answer our prayers. No, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in your individual life. It won't happen in the corporate life. You have to judge your sins. You have to put them away. So do I. And as a church, if we're willing to put away our sins and have our hearts humble before Him, will He hear and answer? He's just said that He will. We're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. He's near. He's listening. His eyes are running to and fro on the earth, looking for a heart to call upon Him. He'll hear. But He's not going to answer hypocrisy. He is not going to answer and, and, and bless those who want to live in the world, live in sin, and aren't going to deal with their sin, and then want to come into His presence and play act when it comes to praying. Brethren, you and I have been put in the most glorious position. We're dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty. And He notices our love. He notices when we honor His name. And He hears us when we call. Why would we want to go anywhere else? Why would you want to be on someone under someone else's shadow? You're in the glorious position. Stand into it. Make much of it. The Lord will exalt His cause. He's jealous over His name. He will visit His vine again. And He's going to come with might and power to His church. I don't know what He's going to do in the world. But I know He will visit His vine. Because He says, I will be with you in trouble. 
May the Lord give us grace to call upon Him. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. The Lord reward, will reward the wicked, but those dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty, while they see it, they will not feel it. It won't touch them. A thousand may fall at one side of them, ten thousand at another side of them, but it won't come nigh the righteous, God's people. You have been put in the enviable position, and all you did was come and put your trust in him. Don't let anybody move you from that position. Don't let anybody talk you into another position, another shadow. Stay under the shadow of the Almighty. He notices your love. He notices the fact that you honor his name. And he's going to hear you when you call. Parents, that's what you need, is it not? The Lord hearing you when you call, especially for your children. Children, that's what you need. It's not an education. It's not wealth. It's not a car. It's not popularity. You know what you need, children? It's to know the Lord will hear you when you call. You've got to come to Christ and trust in Him. And if you do, He said, this is your lot. Because He has set His love upon me, therefore I will deliver Him. I will set Him on high because He hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Young people, this is what you need. Our Father in heaven, we come to thee tonight, thanking thee that thou hast revealed thyself in the creation round about us. But our God, we praise thee tonight that thou hast revealed thyself in this book that thou hast given to us. We're thankful for this particular psalm and the great promises that are ours all through the psalm. But Lord, we're thankful this night that we have a God who loves us, a God who takes note of us, a God who sees even our feeble efforts to please him. Lord, we come to praise thee that thou art our God. Lord, we confess that oftentimes we are not worthy to be called by thy name and our statements in this earth as to thy glory and thy goodness and thy grace are not accurate. Lord, we pray that you would help us to live that which we know and that, Lord, you would use us in our day and age, whether we're laughed at or whether we're ridiculed. Lord, use us in our day and age to bear the name of Christ, to love thee, and to truly call upon thy name. Lord, we pray that this week we would see answers to our praying. That we would see answers to our praying in our homes, answers to our praying in our society, answers to our praying even in this church. Lord, we pray that you would indeed come and answer as you have promised. Lord, we have come not to dwell under the shadow of Egypt, not to dwell under the shadow of those who are compromising like Lot. Lord, we have come to this night truly to dwell under thy shadow, to abide there, to lodge there. And we ask, Lord, that you would give to us all that you have promised, that you would help us to glorify thy great name. Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Be the abiding portion of all your blood-bought people. Lord, we pray that throughout this week we would know your help, your power, your presence, even as we have seen it promised here in this psalm. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.